Okay, we'll start the interview. Uh, we have uh, the world distinguished hepatologist Dr. Sarin with us. Uh, my name is Seungwon Lee from the Catholic University of Korea. I'm uh, uh, Do Sun Song from Catholic University of Korea. Please introduce yourself. I am Dr. Shiv Sarin from the Institute of Liver and Biliary Sciences, New Delhi. Okay. Um, your theme in this meeting was to, we have we believe was two. One was ACLF and one was FMT. So we'll be asking questions on those subjects. And Dr. Song will ask you about ACLF. Please go. I have, I have two questions. Uh, uh, one I first, uh, I, I, I would ask you about the, uh, the advantage of ARC definition compared to uh, other definition of ACLF. Uh, could you tell us the advantage yes. of ARC definition? Thank you, Dr. Song. ARC is an acronym for APASL, Asian Pacific Association for Study of the Liver, ACLF Research Consortium. So AARC, ARC, is a consortium where about 52 centers in Asia and some in the Europe have joined hands to provide their prospective patient database. And all these patients have been enrolled online and they have been followed up till at least 90 days, death or 90 days, and now up to about four years or so. So it was established in 2012, and we have now 5,000 and about 200 patients enrolled into this. Now ARC is a prospective database where patients were analyzed for high risk of mortality and their outcomes. The initial definition of uh, AP ACLF, that is acute on chronic liver failure, was established in 2007 by APSL and published in 2009. And this definition was based on primarily liver failure. So liver failure was defined as a patient who develops jaundice and within a period and coagulopathy, which is more than 1.5 INR, and within four weeks develops ascites and or hepatic encephalopathy in a patient who has already known chronic liver disease or cirrhosis or unknown, and with a high risk of mortality at 28 days. So this is a simple definition which is applicable to all patients. Now. How is this definition by ARC different than other definitions? And why is it better and more easy to use? The definition by East is a parcel definition. Definition by West that includes the Cliff Consortium and also from the Europe, uh, American groups. The definition includes that a patient has an inciting or a precipitating event and within four to 12 weeks, it varies, develops a worsening of uh, the hepatic condition, liver condition, and this is with two or more extra hepatic organ failures. For example, kidney or lung or coagulation or brain. So two extra hepatic organ failures, and this can be in a patient who is known cirrhosis, or also known decompensated cirrhosis. So it includes patients with chronic liver disease, with cirrhosis, with decompensated cirrhosis. And decompensation can be because of any event, for example, bleed, encephalopathy, or jaundice, or sepsis. And in these patients also, there is high mortality. So this definition from the West has a very heterogeneous about nine groups of patients can be included. Let me count. A patient who has already got decompensation, has ascites, or has got hepatorenal, he becomes further worse because of bleed, because of HE, or because of any precipitating event. So this is a separate group which has a separate natural history. The cliff definition also includes patients who have got a bleeding. Now, bleeding may or may not result. It's a separate natural history of patient with cirrhosis. They also include sepsis, but without having 
any jaundice. Therefore, about nine different types of patients. Suppose somebody asks you that, okay, you have NASH. What drug will you give? You will say, okay, A, B, C, D. I will give this drug to a patient. Suppose there is hepatitis B, chronic B. So you will give a given drug. But in ACLF, using the Western definition, you will have nine groups like SBP going on to hepatorenal. So all these are very heterogeneous patients. The apostle or the ARC definition is a simple definition which involves hepatic failure, which is jaundice and coagulopathy, followed by acute portal hypertension, that is ascites or encephalopathy. And therefore, the ARC definition is superior to this. And the causes, common causes for this are also hepatic insults, not extra hepatic insults. The hepatic insult means jaundice is the driver, not any other disease. So for example, a patient has got chronic pancreatitis and he gets urinary tract infection or he gets pneumonia and he dies because of sepsis. Will you call this patient as acute on chronic pancreatitis or you will call it as pneumonia or UTI in chronic pancreatitis? So we must understand that it is the organ because of which actually the disease is progressing or worsening. So organ damage is primary in definition. So therefore when you say acute on chronic liver failure, liver failure should be the dominant thing. Now the ARC definition has an added advantage because using this definition a score has been developed for the first time called the ARC score, AARC score. The ARC score has five components. It has bilirubin, it has INR, it has lactate and hepatic encephalopathy. All these are part of liver failure and serum creatinine. If you use these five parameters and you calculate and if a patient has a score which is less than 10 he may not need an urgent liver transplant like kch criteria if it is more than 10 then this patient has high probability so if suppose somebody has a score of 11 and in four days it becomes from 11 to 12 just one increase mortality increases by 20 percent or so so such patients should be immediately referred for liver transplant. So ARC score defines at baseline who needs a emergency or priority transplantation. Suppose a patient has a score of four or five, he can wait for a few days and we can see that he can reverse. The other advantage of ARC score is its simplicity and bad side. What do you need to diagnose? You don't need anything specific. You just need an INR, you need a bilirubin, and you need simply whether ascites is clinically present or HE is present. Therefore, I feel the ARC definition is superior. It is homogeneous group of patients with a very well-defined outcome. The second advantage of this is you take up patients before organ failure develops. Suppose a patient already has kidney failure or Suppose a patient has already gone into encephalopathy grade 3 and 4. Then it is a little late for liver transplant. So ARC defines APSL about 10 days to 2 weeks before the cliff or any other defines. And there is a window period. If you diagnose patients early, then you can immune modulate. Then you can prevent sepsis. You can prevent organ failure which is not possible when already organs have failed. So ARC gives a stress on organ dysfunction, not on organ failure. Let's say serum creatinine, once it is 2, it is a bit late for kidneys to recover. So if you pick them up at 1 or 1 1.5, it is much better. So the second advantage of ARC definition is it picks up patients early and there is a golden window of 7 days to 10 days where you can convert immune paresis that is SIRS going to immune paralysis by immune modulation. Drugs like GCSF or other immune modulators to prevent sepsis. So it is liver failure which drives organ failure 
by development of sepsis. Sepsis does not cause liver failure. It is the inflammation, SIRS, immune paresis which causes sepsis and multi-organ failure. So let me recount what are the advantages of the ARC definition. It is simple. It is bedside. It is having homogeneous group of patients. It is diagnosing patients at the right time before multi-organ failure or extrahepatic organ failure develops and it can be used clearly for identifying patients who need to go for liver transplant. Thank you for such a comprehensive review. It's like we heard the one, one of the best lectures about this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you. Okay. Thank okay. You. Uh, my second question is about the uh, uh, revised uh, arc definition. I know I know that uh, revised uh, arc definition will be published soon. Uh, so I I I would uh, ask you about uh, uh, the the important changes of new uh, revised arc definition. Uh, Doctor Song, you are very smart <laughs> <laughs> <Thank you>. because <laughs> this definition is not published. Uh, the consensus was held in uh, October 1 and 2, uh, 2018 in New Delhi and the final draft is getting ready for submission for publication. Uh, the main new change is uh, the definition remains the same, that is uh, a patient who develops uh, jaundice and that is more than 5 milligram and has coagulopathy that is INR of more than 1.5, has ascites and or HE in a known or unknown patient with chronic liver disease or cirrhosis and has a high mortality at 28 days. So this definition which was finalized in 2009 and modified slightly in 2014 is same, there is no change. But what is new? So, first time now ARC has defined what is organ dysfunction and what is organ failure. Let's say liver and brain. So, grade 1 and grade 2 encephalopathy is organ dysfunction, that is brain dysfunction. And grade 3 and 4 is organ failure. So, we should not wait till organ failure develops. We should intervene when organ dysfunction is there. For example, kidney. Cliff uses a serum create of more than two but ARC has said a organ dysfunction is between 1 to 1.5 and there is a large database 3600 patients were analyzed and very carefully seen so normal create for a cirrhosis is probably not 1.5 it's probably 0.7 so 1 to 1.5 may be organ dysfunction and above 1.5 may be organ failure but this needs further review further analysis and therefore the uh, new definition includes first very important difference between organ dysfunction organ failure second this definition has also differentiated what is ACLF and what is acute decompensation now, acute decompensation in cirrhosis can be due to five things. That means it can be variceal bleed, it can be jaundice, it can be ascites, encephalopathy or sepsis. Acute decompensation is within a period of three months. So, how do you differentiate one variety of decompensation that is jaundice and followed by ascites? That is ACLF from the others. So this time a lot of debate was there that ACLF is within four weeks and it is for the first time that is index while acute decompensation can be today patient recovers he again has a decompensation let's say first time he had a bleed second time he gets jaundice after a few months or he gets ascites. So, recurrent presentation with decompensation is a feature of acute decompensation while in ACLF it is for the first time and it is an event which is in four weeks time. So, it's patients is presenting like acute liver failure or liver failure. So, this is the second important part. The third difference is now that patients who have got 
uh, ma majorly reversibility. So the definitions and the debate is what patients can reverse. So it was defined that those who can live 90 days generally would survive one year. Fourth was the change in the epidemiology. You know, like West Asia is also alcohol is becoming number one. It used to be hepatitis B. But now reactivation of B, except maybe China or some part, maybe Korea, most common cause of acute and chronic liver failure today has become alcohol. So the changing terminologies and definitions and the trend is of alcohol. The other important new addition is pediatric ACLF. So we have identified how children below 18 years present with acute and chronic liver failure the need for liver transplant, the timing and which patients will benefit. So generally those patients and there is a large data of acute and chronic and liver transplant from Asia. So many centers doing LDLT. So it is now clear that the first week and avoiding sepsis, multi-organ failure or extra hepatic organ failure gives you survival to the tune of about 85% one year survival. So we should do transplant. Also the new part in the definition and into the arc is use of plasmapheresis to remove damps and remove the uh, damaged uh, dying liver cells. So I think this new definition and the new arc consensus, I can't disclose all the things, is going to be very exciting mm. and hopefully it will be published in next three to six months. Mm. Okay, so two brief, brief questions on FMT. Only has recently been FMT introduced in liver disease, mostly in hepatic encephalopathy. So what do you think is the current indication of um, FMT in liver disease and will it be expanded to other liver diseases in the future? Uh, the FMT which was tried has the basis of changing your gut bacteria. What you eat is possibly sensed first by bacteria then by you. So modulation of gut microbiome uh, is extremely important. We have been working on alcoholic liver disease, severe alcoholic hepatitis. That is defined by when discriminant function is more than 32. By giving the fecal transplant and we use a nasodiodinal approach, not the rectal approach which has been used by the Western group. And we give uh, FMT once a day usually with a donor which is related so hopefully it is HLA matched I mean we don't test HLA in everyone but if it is HLA matched brother or sister and a healthy donor which passes all the donors test then we give FMT and the indication is whether steroid ineligible patients so our first trial which was a pilot study was published in steroid ineligible means they have sepsis or their DF is more than 90 or the patient is not having transplant options or has you know mild SIRS and sepsis those patients we tried and FMT in a pilot study compared to the anecdotal controls showed significant advantage then we completed our second study in steroid eligible pentoxifylin versus the steroids where st pentoxifylin versus FMT and FMT was superior now we are on the verge of completing our third trial, steroid eligible versus FMT. I don't have the data, but now I think it can become from a rescue therapy, can it become the first line therapy? First line means as an alternative to steroid. Steroid is a problem because of, you know, response rate maybe 60 or 70 percent, but infections, selection bias, all these are problems. FMT is very simple. It has the advantage that uh, you know you can modulate every day and the bacteria which are given they stay for a long time six months to one year and I have personal feeling and observation that it is very good. Patient starts feeling better after day four to day mm -hmm. five. The bilirubin starts coming much later but the well-being starts much earlier. So I think current indication wise, I, my first ref, uh, preference is for severe alcoholic hepatitis. 
we have also used in, in hepatitis b related liver failure you will say why hepatitis b and fmt so we have a trial which we have completed and data is being analyzed where we have given tenofovir versus tenofovir plus fmt and the groups were because of liver failure so you treat the virus by giving tenofovir both the groups and you treat liver failure by giving FMT. The third group where we are trying is decompensated NASH. Now the patient has no option. He has ascites and he needs a liver transplant. We do not know the data as of now in this group of patients. So I think the indications might increase. The Westerners have used it for minimal hepatic encephalopathy or HE where they have found using a rectal route some advantage but my feeling is it is the small bowel bacteria which are more changed and need a change so when you give fmt you change the small bowel bacteria you decrease the ammonia production and uh, you know it's quite good uh, uh, to change the gut microbiome rather than antibiotic uh, you may use fmt as a option so uh, you're saying that it is. you think it's better to use uh, gastroduodenoscopy mm -hmm. rather than colonoscopy. So that brings us to our last question. Some, of, some doctors are worried because the patients who receive FMT due to severe liver disease are in very bad condition. And many have alternate mental status and l sometimes large viruses. So some doctors are worried that during yeah. the procedure, some adverse events may occur. So mm -hmm. in your experience, have you experienced any adverse events or can you give us some tips based on your experience? We have almost uh, 200 patients plus who have got FMT done at our center, maybe more. Uh, we do not use endoscope for putting the tube. It is uh, by fluoroscopy guidance and by swallowing it goes to the duodenum. Uh, we avoid having patients with high risk viruses. Mm -hmm. That is uh, certain. Or patients who are uh, in encephalopathy grade 2 or above. So I totally agree with you. Uh, side effects we observed in two patients and one of them, uh, initial screening, microbiology, everything was all right. But after a few days, we found that this patient had uh, PCR positive for um, uh, some anthropathogens. So when we had given him FMT, he was all right for two days. The third day he got fever. And we did not know why he got fever till we knew the donor had some anthropathogenic E. coli mm -hmm. and uh, which got in. So we became more stringent, not by microbiology testing. Now we do PCR for uh, all pathogens to check. The other side effects sometimes are when you put the tube, patient is very uncomfortable. And we keep it for uh, seven days so he doesn't like us. Uh, for some days, at least one or two. So then you have to put some lubricant, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, but after some t uh, two days, he gets all right. And uh, so the second side effects are local. Uh, no patient during the procedure is uh, is uh, denied of necessary antibiotics, but they are generally peri peripheral vein IV and not oral antibiotics. The diet has to be very standardized in the donor a few days all the criteria are available and also of the recipient so uh, we follow them and the Lilly score does not work in these because seven days is too short for uh, changing the liver uh, uh, you know inflammation and so so currently to summarize we are using FMT as an alternative to steroids and uh, in a group of 32 DF or 90 between 32 mm -hmm. to 90 all patients get a biopsy transjugular and also have uh, intestinal assessments of stool and microbiota. I think it's a very promising therapy, but yes, more data is to be published. Okay. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoyed. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs>